I first became interested in aviation when I was a, uh, a young child. My dad was a uh, pilot. Uh, he flew in the Navy and also flew light airplanes at our local airport in Pennsylvania. So he would take my brother and I up on a flight, and uh, that's where I got the inspiration to, to want to fly. Uh, my first flight experience is when I was a youngster. Uh, like I said, my, my dad take me up on flights. Uh, we used to go up to Lake Erie on a a uh, old CB and land on the water and I thought this is really neat to land on an airplane on the water so I started to get the inspiration to fly uh, then. I came into the Air Force in uh, 1964 and entered pilot training at Craig Air Force Base in Alabama and uh, after I earned my wings uh, uh, after a year of training I got into the uh, stayed on at Craig Air Force Base as instructor in the T-37 and did that for four years and then I got into the F-4 Phantom. I entered pilot training for F-4s at davis Monthan Air Force Base which lasts about six months and uh, after the training was over with I was assigned to the Triple Nickel Squadron, the 555th Tactical Fighter Squadron in Yunorn, Thailand and that's where I flew the F-4 uh, for a year, I ended up with 160 combat missions in Vietnam flying the F-4. Uh, after that, I was reassigned to Kadena Air Base on Okinawa, Japan, which uh, also had F-4s, but it also had the Wild Weasels uh, version of the F-4. So I was in the F-4 Wild Weasel Squadron, which in turn got me redeployed back to Karate Air Force Base in Thailand for the uh, last six months of, of the war, so to speak. Uh, as a wild weasel, it's a different mission. Uh, you Basically, our, uh, our motto was first in, last out. So we would precede the strike force to keep the SAMs down, and then uh, while they were doing their work, we would then follow them out and make sure the SAM environment was uh, uh, not going to put them in harm's way. And that was the role of the Wild Weasel mission is to, to uh, keep the SAMs uh, from firing or if they did fire, we could uh, hopefully wipe out their radar network so they wouldn't be useful anymore. Yeah, I like the F-4. It was a good airplane. Uh, basically, it could do a lot of jobs well, but it never did any one particularly good. Uh, it was good for air to air, it was good for air to ground, but uh, it didn't do each each of those two missions very well, but it was adequate. It did a good job. And uh, an outgrowth of the F-4 in Vietnam was uh, the Air Force realized we need airplanes ded dedicated to special missions. And thus they came up with the uh, F-15 for air to air and the F-16 for air to ground. So now you have airplanes that are specialized for a specific mission, whereas the F-4 was sort of like a jack of all trades. Flew the F-4 for, let's see, that would have been one, I'm going to have to flew the F-4 for four years, and uh, I flew the F-4Cs, F-4C Wild Weasels, and F-4Ds uh, at Kadena. I was there for uh, two years. And the F-4, uh, the hours were probably close to about 850, 900 hours, somewhere in there. It was short of 1,000. That's all the best I can remember. I have to get my logbook out to get the actual number, but I think it's just short of 1,000. To get into the SR-71 program, you have to want to go uh, into it. So it's a volunteer program only. Uh, you send a package of uh, all your flying records, your recommendations, uh, all your efficiency of reports. All those are sent to Beale Air Force Base. And your package sits there until the people at Beale determine they have a need for another crew. And once they do that, they sit around a table they look at all these folders from the applicants and they pass them around a table and everyone sort of talks about each applicant and they give it a yes or no and if you get basically a yes from everybody then you're invited out to Beale for a one week of interview and during that one week uh, you come out you interview with the wing commander, the DO, the squadron commander, all these people that have a vested interest in hiring you into the program. And if you pass the interviews, then you move on to the next stage is basically you're flying. You get two check flights in the T-38 and you get a basic check flight in the SR-71 simulator at Beale. 
Uh, then the third major hurdle is at the end of that week is you to go down to Travis Air Force Base and take a, a physical. It's a fairly demanding physical. It's not, as, it's not as demanding as an astronaut physical, but it's a little bit more involved than a, a basic Air Force pilot physical. So if you pass all the interviews, you pass your flying, and you pass your physical, after the end of the week, you go back to where you came from. And for me, that was back to Okinawa. That's where I was flying the F-4. And uh, about two, two and a half months later, I got a letter of acceptance into the program. And uh, that's what happens. After they filter out and they have a need for another crew, you get invited out to Beale to start your training. And I started in uh, June of 1974. And that's where I met up with my backseater, Don Emmons, who is you're now mated. He came out from... Uh, flying B-52s, and we meet for the very first time at Beale, and that's where we start training as a crew together. You always fly in the SR-71 as a form crew. Uh, we never mix and match crews on operational sorties. So if we were flying an operational sortie out of Mildenhall or Okinawa, and one of you are sick for the day or you know sprain your ankle, you're both grounded, and we bring in a backup crew to fly the mission. So... That was very important. You fly as a mixed, as a form crew the entire time because you know each other very intimately and you know each other. If he were just to say something in the cockpit like, oh my gosh, I know exactly what Don's talking about. But oh my gosh, and somebody else, that could mean another thing. So the crew member you form up with, in my case, it was Don Emmons. Uh, you go everywhere together. Uh, the wives often said that the uh, we knew each other better. We knew our own wives because we were spending more time. And yes, our program, uh, you're not home very often, so you're gone a lot. And uh, because of that, I was with Don Emmons a lot of the time. And, uh, you know, we, we flew together. We did everything together as a crew. Uh, if we had the backup crew for the day, we were what we call the mobile crew. So you stay together the entire time. Uh, you get to know each other quite well. The training for the SR-71 is all at Beale Air Force Base in Northern California, and the training lasts roughly nine months long. Uh, during that nine months, uh, your goal as a student pilot is to gather 100 hours. Now, once you get 100 hours in the SR, you're then allowed to go fly the operational missions, uh, first over Okinawa, and then secondly over at uh, RAF Mildenhall in England. We had one simulator. It was a very good simulator, and we relied on it a lot. Uh, since the, the airplane, the SR-71, is very, very expensive to fly, uh, we did a lot of training in the simulator. Uh, as you go through your training program, uh, we try, if you're going to uh, probably fail or wash out of the program, uh, we tried to do it in the simulator before the crew member got to the actual airplane, uh, obviously for a cost reduction. but. Uh, the simulator was very, very uh, uh, dynamic. It, uh, it was a program where uh, we learned things and practiced things that you just can't do in the airplane, you know, f like engine out procedures or getting automatic unstarts and restarts. These things were practiced day in and day out in the simulator before you got into the airplane. Yeah, after you do all your 12 simulator missions, <clears throat> That's when you put your first footstep in the airplane. And I was very uh, uh, lucky I passed all the, the, the simulator missions. And on the 12th, on the, the first time I put my foot in the airplane and they closed the canopy down, you feel a lot better because now all of a sudden with all the simulator training behind you, you had no windows to look out of. Well, now I got a window. So it was very, very uh, comforting to get in the airplane and fly it for the first time uh, with the instructor in the back seat of the trainer model. Uh, you're so well trained that you feel right at home for your very first mission. There's no, there's nothing new coming up other than the fact you can now see outside. That was probably the strangest feeling of being able to see outside. Uh, I found it quite comfortable. You get five dual missions, and generally that's it. If you can't do it within five missions, uh, very reluctantly it would give maybe a sixth one or another extra mission somewhere. But it's so expensive to fly this airplane that uh, if you couldn't make it after five, uh, you were probably going to go back to where you came from. And there's no stigma with our program. Most of the crew members went right back to where they came from and continued to fly. Uh, in the Air Force, uh, if you don't pass a school, a formal Air Force school, 
like getting into F4s or getting into F15s or F16s. If you don't pass that school, then you meet probably what's going to be called a FEB, a Flying Evaluation Board. Well, for our program, for the SR, it's so unique and so different from all the others. We were never part of the Air Force's school of uh, uh, training. We maintained our own in-house training. So if you didn't cut the mustard in the SR, uh, you wouldn't lose your wings and you wouldn't meet an FEB. Uh, you'd go onto another aircraft. So. You know, once you came off the tanker with a full load of gas, which is 80,000 pounds, uh, you would then light the burners, uh, the afterburners, all the way into maximum AB. And the airplane, we did what was called a dipsy doodle, where we'd climb it up super subsonic and then just push it over and get through the sound barrier as soon as we could. There's a high drag region from about 0.98 to Mach 1.03. So you want to get through that region as fast as you can. So we do this dipsy doodle and go through it. Once you went through the sound barrier, then we start a climb up. And we maintain a, a constant airspeed climb, basically at uh, 450 knots equivalent airspeed, K-E-A-S we called it. And as you hold this constant airspeed on the way up, the Mach would accelerate to Mach 1, 1.5, Mach 2, 2.5. Then you'd be leveling off at Mach 3 at about 70,000, 71,000 feet. The mission planning for uh, every SR began basically the day before. Uh, the mission planners would bring the, uh, the route of flight, they'd bring out the maps, they'd bring your computer flight plan, and we would sit down at a table the day before, uh, somewhere around noontime, and just sit there and mission plan all through the route. Uh, the way Don and I mission plan was basically was going through the entire route of flight on the map and, and doing what we called a what-if drill. And you would say, well, what if something happens here? What if we lose an engine here? Uh, what if we see SAMs fired here? What if the MiGs come up here? What if we're low on gas here? So we go around this entire route of flight, giving it a what-if drill. That way, by doing it that way, you have a good game plan to begin with. Because at Mach 3, at you know, 2,000 miles an hour, you don't have a lot of time to, to make up quick, instant decisions. Could you explain some of the missions you were involved with around the world? Uh, basically, uh, the first detachment we flew out, it was DET-1. Uh, that was the original detachment. And uh, all those missions were over in the Pacific Theater. Uh, I would call our bread and butter mission was going through the Korean DMZ uh, from the northwest to the southeast or the southeast to the northwest. Always imaging up into North Korea, obviously. Uh, we also covered the Soviet Union's largest fleet headquarters at Vladivostok. Uh, we've been up to the Kamchak Peninsula and imaged the uh, Petropavlovsk, a city which uh, the Russians had an airfield at the very southern end of the Kamchak Peninsula at Petro. And we would image it as well. So that was basically our missions. Early on, when the crews before my time, their main mission was North Vietnam. They were flying out of Okinawa, covering uh, Hanoi all the time, back and forth. Once Vietnam ended, those Korean theaters and up into the Kamchatka Peninsula became our main stay. Primary locations we went uh, out of Det 4 at RAF Mildenhall uh, were up into the, uh, the Barents Sea area, and we would uh, image the Soviet Union's second largest naval fleet headquarters at Murmansk and do a 180-degree turn, imaging them back, and then come back into another refueling off of the coast of Norway. Then we could either take the airplane, uh, if the mission called for it, we'd go into the Baltic Sea and do a, a, a counterclockwise turn, slow the airplane down to 2.8 Mach, since the Baltic Sea is such a small confines, uh, and image all the Warsaw Pact countries off to the right-hand side. And then you could either do that mission and then also another mission we had in the FRG of Germany, we do a clockwise turn in Germany, imaging all the Warsaw Pact countries off to the left hand side. So basically between the, the, the Barents Sea, the Baltic, and then Germany, those were our bread and butter missions. Uh, a few times we flew the missions uh, all the way down through the Mediterranean. Uh, I remember when Buzz Carpenter did that, it was uh, about a nine to ten hour mission all the way into when Yemen was two countries. It was North Yemen and South Yemen. 
the government wanted to learn some more intelligence on that country, we flew all the way out of Mildenhall. Very, very long flight for the, the crews flying up. Uh, we also did the post-strike of the uh, raids on Libya. Uh, we did three or four missions on that. And that pretty much covers the missions we flew out of Mildenhall. One mission that sort of, uh, Don and I were flying out of Det 1, which is out of Okinawa, and we were going up to the Kamchatka Peninsula, and there were three MiG-25s. It was a perfect storm. This wouldn't normally happen. But uh, there were no clouds, and I could see uh, contrails probably 200 miles off my nose, and they were in a circular orbit. And didn't know what was there. I just saw the contrails. It wasn't until we got closer I could actually break out and I could see three distinct contrails in this orbit. And then when they came out of the orbit, they started heading towards our aircraft. And uh, I told Don to get ready with the jammers and uh, also turn his view sight on because they're coming right underneath us. And they tried to, in, after they came out of the circle, they went into about a 10 mile trail with each other and they popped up to try to get us, but there was, there was no way they were going to get there. And uh, I felt quite comfortable. Nothing happened. It was a very uh, ho hum. I had, they might have been just doing a practice run for all I know, uh, but nothing was fired that day at us. All our missions in the United States were basically training sorties. And what we tried to do with those was to replicate as best we could the sorties that you're going to be flying overseas, the operational missions. So those were all in the western United States because there were some wide open expanses where we could do the sonic booms because sonic booms around the United States are, uh, you got to be careful what cities you're over. We had to avoid all major cities. I think the population in excess of 30,000, we had to avoid them by so many miles. But our mission planners developed all their routes in the United States. Overseas, the plan mission planners developed the, the routes so that we were focusing on the targets and the airplane at the right point in space at the right time to get the best intelligence with the cameras on board, either on the left side or on the right side of the airplane. So that's how all our, our missions were planned by the mission planners, to be at the right point in space, either maybe in a bank or level, so the cameras are always looking into the bad guys at the right time uh, all the time. Uh, most missions, uh, we had a lot of planning ahead. Uh, there were a few contingencies back in the uh, uh, early 70s, 75, 76, 77, to come over to Mildenhall, because we weren't at Mildenhall to begin with. And uh, depending on what NATO was doing with exercises over in, over in Europe, we would be called over on a very short notice to, to go over to Mildenhall and uh, fly specific missions during the NATO exercises. So those were the ones that were sort of ad hoc. And then eventually we became full time at Mildenhall at the debt four. Uh, from takeoff to maximum speed, uh, we only had one mission that actually did that that I remember. And it was called, we called it the rocket ride out of Okinawa. Any other mission, you would take off and refuel. But the mission out of Okinawa, it didn't fly it very often. I was very fortunate I got to fly it one time. But you take it off with a 65,000 pound fuel load and uh, you don't hit a tanker. You climb on out and just keep climbing, climbing. And you head up to North Korea, you make one pass through the Korean DMZ and you come back to Milton, or back to Okinawa. And the, minutes, the, the time on the computer flight plan was 57 minutes from takeoff to landing. Very, very busy and very demanding mission, but uh, it was very neat to not have to refuel. Just one, one swing and that was it. Uh, the very first SR-71 operational mission uh, was flown out of Okinawa, Japan, at Det-1, in, uh, I believe it was March of 1968. That was the very first operational mission. And we stayed at uh, Okinawa ever since my first mission in 1968. We started picking up Mildenhall in 1975, 76 time frame going over on short deployments for a month. The next thing, we were over there two months, and then we'd be over there for three months at a time. And pretty soon we were there, after about three years of doing this monthly thing, we were there for pretty much full time after about three years. And finally, uh, it became a full-fledging full detachment around 19, I'll say, 83, 82, 83, when Maggie Thatcher finally made an announcement that Debt 4 actually existed.
A lot of people think with the SR being so, such an advanced airplane, it would have a very exotic cockpit, in it, and it didn't. Uh, it's very much steam gauges, uh, very basic cockpit, uh, a lot of room because we were a full pressure suit, so you needed to have a lot of room in the cockpit. Uh, I found it uh, very uh, well laid out. Basically, you had the throttles on the right, and you had the stick to fly with in your hands. Uh, all your flight instruments were directly in front of you. Uh, off to the right, you had a sub panel that uh, had your autopilot on. Uh, to get good imagery uh, and not degrade the imagery, we went through the autopilot and turned it on when the sensors were working. So we'd l fly the airplane through these little wheels, a little pitch wheel, a little roll wheel, left and right and up and down. Once we engaged the auto navigation, then the roll wheel became disabled and then our computer would then navigate around the course. So all we had to do was follow this wee little pitch wheel with our right hand through the pressure suit. Uh, very roomy cockpit with a full pressure suit on it uh, needs to be that way. And uh, you're strapped in tight to an ejection seat for the whole time you're up there. So it's, uh, you know, you get uncomfortable every once in a while, but with the pressure suit, you can always dial in some pressure to sort of relieve the pressure and just sort of sit there for, a, a, you know, 30 seconds to a minute and then take the pressure back off. The pressure suit was uh, very comfortable. Uh, it, it was a little while to get used to it because no one else flies. You fly with a flight suit uh, and all your other airplanes, but when you get in the SR, it is a full pressure suit. You'll find it fairly cumbersome to begin with, but after, you know, you get very adjusted to it, it's very, very comfortable. Uh, you can contain, you can take, control your own temperature the entire time. Uh, to drink water, uh, we had these squeeze bottles like marathoners do in races and has a little feeding port so you get your bottle of water or Gatorade or orange juice, whatever your favorite uh, drink was. You put it in your little feeding port in your side of the helmet and you push that tube in and you could squeeze the water or Gatorade, whatever you were drinking. To stay nourished on flights, we took up tube food and it came in, if you would, giant sized toothpaste dispensers. That's what it looked like with a feeding tube at the end of it and would screw the feeding tube on that would break the seal. And then you could take your tube food and push it into the pressure suits, little uh, iris it had right here, shove it through there and you could squeeze in your tube food. And uh, I always took up the macaroni and cheese and I took up the beef and gravy for uh, for dessert, I had the chocolate pudding, vanilla pudding tubes. So that was your meals for the in-flight. Obviously, the uh, role of the SR-71 is to gather intelligence, and we did that with sensors. And uh, the sensors were located on the, the forward part of the airplane, uh, which we called the chine. And on each side, there's bays that they're on piano hinges and they fold down. And then, the, depending on the mission requirements, the intel folks would put the correct cameras up in each of these bays, connect the electrical, the air conditioning, and then the door would be closed and it'd have a ga glass pane if it's an optical camera. So we had two kinds of imaging. We had either radar, which was up in the nose of the airplane, a radar imaging system. It was called the ASARS, which stands for Advanced Synthetic Aperture Radar System. So with a radar producing an image or bouncing a radar beam down to the ground, and get, gathering the, ref, the reflection, it would make an image as we cruised along at Mach 3. The other cameras, what we call what I call wet film photography, uh, they had to have obviously good sun angles, whereas the radar, you could have, you were all weather, day or night, it didn't matter for the radar imaging. The radar imaging system, the ASARS was good to about oh, a resolution of, I'd uh, say, uh, 12 inches. Uh, some of our cameras were uh, down to as low as about four to five inch resolution. Uh, very, very good optical cameras. So that's how we gathered the intelligence out. on each side of the airplane on the left and right were the sensor. So when we'd roll the airplane over a country or just be straight and level, they were imaging maybe 50, 100 miles inland to the bad guys or directly over them. Uh, flying the SR at Mach 3, uh, you have to be very light on the controls, and that's why... Now, you can hand fly the airplane the entire time, uh, but you're going to degrade the imagery probably because of a little bit of a porpoising action when you're hand flying it. Very hardly even noticeable, but if your sensors, you need a nice stable platform, and that's why you fly it through the autopilot with these little wheels that take out any kind of a pitch moment. They make it nice and stable. 
The one unique thing with the SR that I don't think any other airplane I know of uses is a uh, liquid chemical ignition system. And for the SR, uh, because of the high flash point of our fuel, which was JP7, a one-of-a-kind fuel, no other airplane uses that I know of. Uh, I've seen crew chiefs throw cigarette butts and matches into this JP7 and it just drowns out. So it's a very high flash point fuel. Well, to ignite this high flash, high flash point fuel, Kelly Johnson and his band of engineers had to come up with a unique way of igniting it. And it was with a liquid chemical called triethylborane, T-E-B. That's why we called it TEB for short. So this triethylborane is a liquid chemical that if I had it in a squirt gun right here and I squirt it into this room, it explodes on contact with the atmosphere. And that became our ignition source to light off the fuel. So when we started the engines up, it would spray this metered amount of TEB, this liquid chemical, into the uh, combustion chamber. It would explode, and that would light off our fuel. When we put the throttles up into afterburner, the same thing happened back there. This metered amount of TEB would be sprayed into the fuel, go kaboom, and that in turn would light off the afterburner. Um, need to acknowledge the fact that uh, the maintenance crews for the airplane are highly uh, selected individuals. Each crew chief had his own airplane. Uh, each airplane was in a specific hangar. Uh, little little hangars, if you will. It holds each SR-71 at Beale and the same thing overseas at Mildenhall and Okinawa. Uh, the crew chiefs did a good job. Uh, this airplane is very difficult to maintain. Uh, if it came back, called what we called code one, which meant that it had no write-ups whatsoever, a perfectly good airplane. It took the crew chief and all his assistant crew chiefs, it took them a minimum of around 24 hours to regenerate it for the next mission. And they're working all through the day and through the night to get it ready. If it comes down with a, a malfunction that needs to be fixed, they'll stay up all day, all night to, to get this thing repaired for, for another mission. And at the two detachments, we didn't have a luxury of having an entire fleet of airplanes. Uh, we always kept uh, a minimum of three airplanes over at Okinawa, and we had two airplanes at RF Mildenhall all the time. Those airplanes to be swapped out every year, about June of every year, would swap them out with new ones to be, to be replaced for the, for the next year. No one ever thought they were doing anything special flying the SR, but uh, you, when you look at it, back at it historically, uh, you did some, uh, some good things for the government in obtaining the intelligence needed. But at the time, uh, we were merely flying the airplane, gathering intelligence we were sent to take, and thought that was the mission. So we never really put it in perspective of what you were doing, uh, gathering the intelligence for the United States. When I sold it out in the U-2, it was a good experience. Uh, Rob Bateman was my instructor, and he taught me well. Uh, it's a good feeling. Uh, it's a nice airplane. It, it handles well. It has its own unique characteristics as well. Uh, it's uh, very, very difficult to land well. You can land it, but to, to land it ideally, it takes a lot of work and a lot of skill. Uh, flying it, I found it a very uh, honest airplane. Uh, when I got into the uh, KC-135s, uh, again, I found it a very honest airplane, very much uh, when I retired out of the Air Force and we got into the airlines, it's like f flying a 707, basically, is what the KC-135 was, a Boeing 707. So, uh, handled well, flew well, had a good autopilot, and uh, it was nice to know that you had all the gas that everyone wanted up there, so I, I enjoyed uh, transferring the fuel. My hobbies today are basically uh, writing books on the SR-71. Uh, I play tennis three times a week with a group of guys, which is a very fun. It keeps me uh, uh, lean and mean, if you will. And uh, I also f instruct up at McKinney Airport in Texas, just north of Dallas where I live. Uh, there's an airport 
has two flying clubs, and I fly, I, I'm a flight instructor at both of those clubs, and I teach students uh, basic flying and commercial instrument ratings, whatever they like. But I enjoy doing that. It's, uh, it's another, another way of relaxation. Uh, both the F-4 and the SR have their own flying characteristics. Uh, uh, I would say just because of memories and sights and things you don't see in any other airplane, the SR would have to stand out above the F-4. Uh, but there's things you can do in the F-4 that you can't do in the SR-71. But uh, the uniqueness and uh, uh, the historical background of the SR sort of puts it all in perspective. Today's planes are so modern, uh, there's some that I wish I had flown, but back in my day, I think I flew everything that I really wanted to fly. Uh, I was very lucky when I was the wing commander at Beale, I got to fly. Uh, I went and got checked out in the KC-135s, so I was flying it in a left seat. I went and soloed and flew the U-2, uh, have about 45 hours in the U-2, uh, solo as well. And I flew a couple times in the SR, and uh, I was flying the T-38. So my last three years in the Air Force, I was flying four airplanes, you know, concurrently, which was an ideal job for anybody. And I can't think of any other airplane other than the exotic ones today, like the F-22 and the F-35. I wish I could fly, but back in those days, I think I was flying everything I wanted to. Uh, I've written uh, over the years since 1995, ironically, at five years apart, I've written five books on the SR-71. And uh, if anyone would like to get the copy of the books, uh, the best way to do it is to buy them on eBay. Uh, that's where I sell them, on eBay. You have to be very careful because if you want me to autograph it, it has to be from the seller's ID of SR-71 pilot, 1974 to 1981. That is my seller's signature. And then you would get my autograph with it. Uh, there's a lot of people selling the books on there, but if you want my autograph, that's the seller's ID you have to look for. Yeah, I've been very fortunate to, uh, there's a big audience all around the globe that wants to hear more about the SR-71. And uh, I have been doing a lot of talks in the United States, uh, the different groups. And we have other crew members that do talks as well. Uh, I've just been very fortunate to do a lot of them. Uh, all over the United States. Uh, when I come to England, I probably, in a month, I'll do uh, 10 or 11 talks all around the UK. There's a, there's a big audience in the UK that loves to hear the SR-71 story, and uh, I enjoy telling it and uh, meeting a lot of neat people. Overall, did you enjoy your time in the Air Force? Best time, uh, uh, my 24 years in the Air Force were good. Uh, I did a, I, I loved it. Uh, if I, I can't think of anything I'd want to do over again uh, and change it. Uh, I think I had a perfect career as far as all my flying went. Uh, a lot of different airplanes, and I think I flew the right ones that, uh, that a lot of people want to get into.